Good evening, everyone, and welcome to all of you that are here in person and also those of you that are joining us by Zoom tonight. Um, we're really glad that you're here for Mammals and More on the Move in March with Kirk Gentelin from Maine Coast Heritage Trust. Um, this program, as you likely already know, is being sponsored by the Belfast Free Library, Friends of Sears Island, and Maine Coast Heritage Trust. Many of you know Brenda Harrington, who plans all kinds of the adult programs here at the library. Um, she does a wonderful job of that, but she's going to be facilitating the Zoom tonight and recording the presentation. And if you want to learn more about upcoming events at the library, just go to their website and check out their events page. Um, in just a moment, I'll let Kirk get started. But first, I just want to quickly introduce myself and tell you a little bit about the organization that I work for. My name is Ashley McGuire, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Friends of Sears Island. Um, our organization is the land manager of uh, Sears Island in Searsport. We take care of the 600-acre conservation easement on the island, and that covers about two-thirds of the area of the island. Um, we maintain public accessibility to the trails and beaches there, act as stewards of the land, and we offer a wide array of educational programs to the public. And our event offerings range from educational presentations like one-on-one uh, -on -one uh, sorry, the ones like we're doing tonight. Um, we also do children's programming and we have activity kits that we do and our popular Solstice by the Sea programs. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the good work that our group is doing, you can um, check out our website and we always encourage you to consider becoming a member um, as well. So you can find out more about that at friendsofsearsisland.org. We're happy to have Kirk Gentlin here to Gentlin here tonight as our presenter to talk about what animals are up to right now as we move from winter into what appears to be an early spring. Kirk is an avid nature observer and the regional stewardship manager for the Maine Coast Heritage Trust for Midcoast Maine and has 30 years of environmental education experience from working all over the country. Uh, he lives on the St. George Peninsula with his family and writes a nature column called Nature Bummin on Maine Coast Heritage Trust. Um, so before I turn it over to Kirk, I just wanted to say that if you are joining by Zoom, you can put your questions in the chat box and then Brenda will help um, give your questions out at the end. So Kirk will go do his presentation, then we'll have a question period at the end that you can ask him whatever you want. All right. Thanks for being here, Kirk. We'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Is that all good? All right, cool. Um, uh, I got the lazy man's bifocals. Hold on. Uh, hi, my name is Kirk. Nice to meet you. Uh, welcome to Mammals and More on the Move. We've already discussed this. This is uh, the Rockland Breakwater. Um, this is my thank you slide. Um, I want to thank uh, this is a harp seal. This was in Vinyl Haven Harbor. 2005, the a harbor froze, and um, this guy pulled itself out. Thanks to the friends of Sears Island um, for reaching out and organizing this. Ashley is fantastic. You should all be really nice to her. I want to thank the Belfast Free Library for hosting. Brenda's great. Everyone should return their books on time. And MCHT, Bank Coast Heritage Trust, um, for considering outreach like this, important enough to be uh, work, and I appreciate that. So everyone should read my blog, Nature Bowman. <laughs> with Kirk Gensland at the mchc.org. I also want to thank you all for coming out and um, you all on the Zoom. Uh, hi, Mom. Hi, Amy. Hi, Allison. And um, pats on the back for everyone. This is your thank you slide. Um, quick. <laughs> all right. Quick intro um, on me. I've worked for the Maine Coast Heritage Trust um, as a land steward in the Midcoast since 2007. I started on Vinyl Haven. This is from the ferry in the ferry terminal dock on Vinyl Haven. Um, where I lived with my wife, Amy, for 11 years, and son, Leaf, for six years. He's 15 now. Um, we moved to the St. George Peninsula in 2015. Um, I still got to Vinyl Haven every week um, for work. Um, before MCHT, um, I worked the environmental education and ecotourism circuit, three to, nine, uh, three to nine month gigs. I lived in 14 different states, Georgia to Alaska, Tanglewood around here, and Hog Island in Maine I worked at. This was a after school group that I had called Outdoor Explorers on Vinyl Haven. Um, as part of my stewardship for MCHT, um, I've led all kinds of walks and talks up and down the coast on all kinds of nature topics. Um, and it's always good to partner up 
with uh, groups like Friends of Sears Island and Belfast Free Library, meet new people. This is my third talk this year. This is my first in person, and I'm really excited about that. Nice to see um, faces um, in person. <laughs> That's me tracking snow angels <laughs> in Acadia National Park. Um, I identify as a nature observer and follow the nature observer's simple mantra of you can observe just by looking, Yogi Berra. Um, I spend a lot of time outside, and I'm fortunate that most of my post-schooling jobs have been outside. Um, and even though my jobs aren't always nature observing per se, as an observer, you're always looking, always listening. Um, and for me, it's as simple as that, stacking the odds in favor of me seeing stuff simply by showing up and uh, being out there. Anyway, so, yeah. Um, welcome to Mammals and More on the Move. Um, funny how we got to this title and how this presentation has morphed from a program um, is just as much and more as the mammal stuff. And we'll see what you think. Um, this is part of my things I've noticed um, series of presentations uh, and things to look for um, that's really fun to put together. So I thank you once again. I also do a trilogy of nature presentations. Owls are easy, otters are easier, and fishers are core. Um, anyway, we're going to cover a lot of things, a lot of uh, natural history uh, concepts. And uh, when I remember, I will point out the buzzwords um, that we cover that might satisfy curriculum standards if you're working on a degree. Um, some stuff uh, will be things that we can see and look for right away, like otters. Um, other stuff like this long-eared owl um, chick, um, you might just pick signs up of, or owlet, I guess it is. Um, but with nature observation, actually seeing things, critters in the flesh is not really the ultimate goal. It's nice, it's great when it happens, um, but learning about what's going on is the goal and becoming familiar with what's around you um, this was on Treat Island in Cobbs Cook Bay, um, way, you know, down east. Um, we'd been on the island for 10 minutes and we found the, long, the ninth long-eared owl nest ever documented in Maine. Um, anyway, I'm a firm believer in you know what you know, and I try to learn every day. And the more I learn, the more impressed with just how much I don't know, um, what I come to. But I know what I know from personal experience and doing research and field guides and reference books, um, there's also going to be a little math involved, so be patient with me. Um, so I will present, but I don't pretend to be an expert on anything. And anyone who tells you they're an expert on anything in nature is pulling a leg, either yours or their own, sometimes both, which can be very uncomfortable. This is the PSA. This show is nature-based. Um, with nature observation, we celebrate death and grow stuff. The same as we celebrate life, which is wondrously. Um, anyway, this show has not gone through any filters, so there may be photos that might disturb a little bit. Um, I offer no apology, just a heads up. These are snow fleas. This is a mass casualty site. <laughs> so disturbing. Um, and even though we're going to focus on animals, we don't want to forget about the early flowers. This is dwarf mistletoe. I took this picture. These are male flowers two days ago. Um, and there's also early mushrooms and even slime molds from last year that can be found this time of the year. Um, plus things are going on intertidally. This was actually in Northport at where we used to go tide pooling with Tanglewood. Um, Maine nudibranch lay laying eggs. Um, and insects are just around the corner. This is a bad picture of a morning cloak butterfly, but they overwinter as adults. Will this be the year that we see them in March? I don't know. It'll be crazy. We honor and recognize them. We just aren't going to talk about them. All right, enough. Let's begin with some more, um, some of the end more. Um, we're talking about stuff that we might be able to see, stuff going on right now. Who's already sitting on eggs? Bald eagles, of course. They start early, they have the longest parental time of any bird associated with their offspring. Five weeks of incubating, then they fledge 70 to 98 days later. Um, and the, di the time disparity is they lay their, their eggs asynchronously. Yeah, asynchronously. Um, so one, they lay one egg one day, wait two days, lay another, but they start incubating right away. So that first egg will hatch early. That's the big one, kind of like the mean older brother or sister. Um, gets all the food, grows faster. It can leave 10 days earlier than the, ne uh, than the next offspring if it lets it survive. Um, we think with bald eagles around here, June for fledging. So that would be April, uh, March, April hatching. So right now they're sitting on eggs as we are here. Their nests, of course, are known to be huge. 
This is in Roberts Harbor in Vinyl Haven. Um, one in Florida, they add to it each year. One nest in Florida was 20 feet deep, 10 feet wide, and weighed whatever three short tons are. I don't know what that is. It says in parentheses then 2.7 metric tons. I don't know. Anyway, weighed a lot, broke the tree. This is in Roberts Harbor, and I used to sell cards at the store on Vinyl Haven. And uh, I put that one, I called it an eagle nest. And I had somebody get in my face. I'm like, that's not an eagle's nest. And I was like, really? Because there's a bald eagle chick in there, and there's this. Um, an osprey made the nest, but the eagle had taken over. When it stops being an osprey nest and when it starts being an eagle nest is to be discussed. Um, great horned owls right now on Vinyl Haven, they are the top predator. I knew of at least eight different pairings around the island um, and um, found a couple nests. Um, both adults incubate change places during the crepuscular times, dawn and dusk. They'll call to each other um, as either the male or female gets closer to the nest. And it's kind of, it's very charming. That was a good way to find these nests um, or just find out where the owls are nearby. They incubate for 35 days. Um, they fledge 35 days later. And this picture um, was from May 14th, 2014. And these are just about to fledge. This, um, Freshly fledged. This was May 13th, 2006. I loved doing this about March because I got to look up all these dates and pictures and was like, oh, okay, so now I'll do the math backwards. Um, anyway, so if th this one had already fledged, could have fledged days before, let's just say it fledged on the 13th. That means about April 8th it would have hatched, which means March 5th or so egg laying. So right now they've laid their eggs. They're sitting on them. Um, if you know where the nests are, this is a great time um, to locate them. Um, It might be one of those three to four. I've only seen two. Um, I've never seen more than two fledglings. They probably lay three on a good year. Maybe the third one survives, kind of like eagles. Um, the funny thing about this, this is actually a juvenile um, in August. So this is what they look like in May. They look like this, like an adult. The only reason I knew this was a juvenile because it was begging. You hear that, that at night, that is a uh, great horn owl, owlet begging. And this one, I got, let me walk right underneath it. Um, <laughs> I kept begging, not that I was going to give it anything. Um, and of course, around here, though, on the mainland, way more barred owls. It's funny because barred owls, you're probably familiar with around here. Um, on Vinyl Haven, I mean, I used to go owling, but that they're 11 years, never once heard one or saw one. Great horns, snowy saw wets, long eareds and short eareds, but never... Uh, Bart, anyway, these guys take 42 days to fledge, 33 days incubation. Mid to late May is when they fledge, which means mid-March, they should be laying eggs. So right now, the tricky thing with barred owls for me is, or that I've been finding, is that they're cavity nesters, as opposed to these big nests with eagles or owl or great horn owls. Um, <laughs> these guys just disappear. And um, they can be all over a neighborhood. We hear them all the time in my neighborhood in St. George. And if you asked any of my neighbors where the nest was, I can almost guarantee that each of them would say in their backyard. <laughs> they just make the rounds and really, I mean, not as much as known about barred owls and their courtship because they're hard to figure out. Um, oh, my mom said I look good. Thanks, mom. <laughs> What's that? Woody. Yeah, Woody, Woody Woodpecker. Um, this is a great time. <laughs> to be a woodpecker watcher. I have that written here. Um, cavity nesters have it good. They can start early, um, setting up territories and, ev and evacuating, um, excavating, excuse me, cavities, all kinds of behaviors with woodpeckers, um, with courtship stilling, where two woodpeckers go like this for like minutes. Um, <laughs> wing spreads, you might see tail fans, chases. It's a very exciting time um, right now. And this next one, I'm going to see if this works. Oh. I'm gonna see if this works. I think it will. We don't have quick time. The quick time. Uh, anyway, no, we didn't test that, but we know now. Um, anyway, so this is well, nothing happens. It just jumps out of the hole. But this is a female. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to give it away. Anyway, this is a female red-bellied woodpecker, which is a relatively new um, breeding species. Um, more and more in Maine, 
This is in his yard. This is last week. And you can see she is fully in there. Probably not big enough because remember, these will have two or three young. And by the time they're ready to leave the nest, they are at the hole. They're big. So you got to have more space than just one because he actually parks his truck or he did the other day somewhat nearby. And the next day he said it was just covered, not covered, but had lots of shrapnel pieces that had come out. So um, anyway, just picture it flying out. All right, here we go. Here's your ducks. It's a great time to be a duck watcher. Um, things haven't left yet. Um, Bufflehead scoters. These are long-tailed ducks. We prefer to call them old-tailed duck. Um, me and Don Reamer. Um, you name it. Um, they haven't left yet, and they're getting frisky, which is kind of cool. Um, matching and pair mating. Lots of displays. Chases, the wing flaps. I can't do it really well. The head popping of buffle heads, if you're familiar with buffle heads with that white head. Um, but my favorite has got to be the extended neck display. These are two red-breasted mergansers. And get I took this picture on March 15th, 2009. So tomorrow's the 15th anniversary of this picture. I didn't even know it existed until the other day when I was looking for it. Um, anyway, two males extending. But then when the female comes by, they do the lean. Um, and this is in the basin on Vinyl Haven. I know you all got a harbor and a river and stuff. This is going on right now as well. You can see the female here. It's kind of a little tricky. She's got facing this way, and she's kind of flashing him that nictitating membrane like she's not interested. That's a buzzword, nictitating membrane. Um, anyway, so this, though, was the next year in the basin. Um, you can see there's a female red-breasted merganser. This is on the 20th, so this would be next week, in theory, around here or even out there. Um, and she will get in these positions that the male feels he'll keep circling her and he'll try to get on top of her and she lets him slide off over and over again. Then finally she lets him on. And then there's this, and this was 20, 30 seconds, uh, the whole thing. Um, and that is the cloacal kiss. So there's mating going on even before they go to their breeding territories as they're pair bonding. Lots of cool stuff to watch if you're into watching ducks have sex. Um, so woodcocks, shorebirds of the woods, this is also going on right now. They're already here. There's some already here. Um, I think my wife saw one in Rockland, um, or fly. She saw one the last day of February, which is pretty early. I usually think of uh, mid February or mid, mid March is the time when I start seeing them, but this is a classic case. Any group that's going to be leading, um, an outing is going to have it in April. You don't need to wait till April to see these guys. They're out there, go out at dusk. They, um, they, anyway, you don't need to, it's great. And one of my favorite parts of watching people develop as nature observers who come on my walks is telling them that it's time to stop coming on my walks um, because they can see it on their own. Do it on your own. You have to find it yourself. Sounds rude. I'm from Jersey. Um, anyway, uh, woodcocks, of course, are famous if you are not familiar with them. For paints, they do this paint. Can't, can't display, and then the males take um, off into the air. And if you're not, it's a great. Um, they make the sound with their wings, and they slowly rise up. You're always looking above where they are. You'll see their shadow higher and higher until you can't see them. I don't know, hundreds of feet up, millions. Of, I don't know, way up high, and then it's a free fall. Then they get quiet right when they're about to land, and then they land. And it starts all over again. They go, paint, paint. So glad they could see that at home. Um, anyway, they're awesome, and they are definitely around right now. BBs, soon enough. Flycatcher, often early April. I'm going to guess March this year. They are a good example of having uh, being open to food diversity, different strategies of getting food, a flycatcher that doesn't need insects to be flying um, to do all right. Phoebes have no problem landing on the ground, picking off stuff out west. It's black Phoebes that stay further north than any other flycatcher around here. It's um, eastern Phoebes. And of course, yellow rumped warblers, um, with, a, with a myrtle warblers, the other low, uh, name for them. Um, these guys are actually overwinter on Vinyl Haven. Plains Island, they, have a, they are the only warbler that can digest bayberry. And it doesn't matter if there's a lot of snow, no snow. As long as there's bayberry, these guys will stick around. 
and stay further north. Um, all right. I would be remiss, it says it right here, if I did not mention vernal pools at this point. Um, this is a peeper, not a uh, indicator species of vernal pools, but I wanted to mention this because I heard a peeper on the 26th of February, which is by far the earliest, I think maybe mid-March once or twice. Um, the only reason I heard it was because I took the compost out and went to change a memory card in one of my trail cameras. Um, but when we think about vernal pools and we think about that awesome migration, it's uh, wood frogs, the ones with the mask um, that go to the vernal pools. This is an indicator species. They lay the egg masses. Um, kind of looks almost like a, a die, um, just a one point of die. No membrane around. This is the embryo right here. No membrane. You can have a ton of them. If you pick them up, you feel like if you threw them to your friend, it would splash all over them. Where, well, no, don't, well, anyway. And spotted salamanders, if you threw it, you could catch it. Um, this is spotted salamanders. Oh, I should mention this. On Vinyl Haven, there's no wood frogs. So it's really easy to tell the egg masses. They're all spotted salamanders. Um, this is one night um, I took a bunch of, you know, Willie and Joey and those guys out um, to find. And this is more, this is with the spotted salamander. Got that nice membrane um, around on the inside. They stay in the vernal pools a lot longer. It takes them what, five to eight weeks to hatch, where the wood frogs, and this is, in my experience, even if they're out right now, they'll wait until the first week of April. And my birthday, just so everyone knows, it's April 28th, um, I go to vernal pools, and that's often when I see like the first tadpoles. Um, but when to go look, uh, tradition has it that the first um, warm, rainy evening um, in the spring, late winter is when they move. And when I say warm, over 40 degrees, these are cold-blooded animals. 40 still is pretty cold um, and wet enough, and you will see them. Now, I heard a peeper on the 26th. On the 27th was the perfect conditions for migration. And I thought, I was like, this is going to be a February vernal pool amphibian migration. Um, sounds awesome. 48 degrees, no wind. It had rained the day before. It rained all day, so the ground was warm. I drove around, did my normal route, and I saw nothing. But then I, oh wait, oh, man, I forgot about this. Spotted salamanders. Um, one of the coolest things about spotted salamander egg masses is the algae that grows in there. Uh, it's this algae, it's the only place you find them. It's a, whatever algae of the spotted salamander eggs. Um, and the, what the algae takes the waste and processes it, and the salamander, um, Eats the, eats the algae in the egg. So it's a symbiotic relationship, which is great, except for after they leave the vernal pool, it's an algae, a photosynthetic plant that's living in a nocturnal animal that lives underground. Not gonna get much sunlight. The algae is stressed and stressed from then on out for years, um, barely surviving, but it's whatever, I don't know, offspring, budding, whatever it is with algae, um, gets put into the eggs. Um, and passed on that way. So right here, it's a very symbiotic relationship. Buzzword. Anyway, this is what I found the other day. And this is a wood frog that probably came out on the 27th. Probably, and it got cold, and it freeze-dried. Rob Sinclair, wherever you are, um, came up with that one. Um, so um, anyway, there's pluses and minuses for being the first one there. These ones got to get to the vernal pools lay their eggs because the vernal pools tend to dry up. Say that, la and the vernal pools in my area, a lot of them um, rely on uh, snow melt. Um, and last year there was no snow melt. And it was so scary, it wasn't scary, but it was like, oh, I wonder what's gonna happen. And then we got that wet June. And I'll tell you, I saw more wood baby frogs in the fall than any other year. It was a great year. Anyway, molt, just a quick thing on molt. The loon, I think of loons as a saltwater animal because I see them off the Vinyl Haven Ferry a lot. Winter plumage, a little bit of white spots coming on in. This guy will turn to this um, pretty quickly. This is actually one way that I can tell that the days are getting longer because they start molting, but probably better. Oh, there's a closer one of the loon. Probably better, though, is um, example is the black guillemots. You know, close relative of puffins, kind of the same niche as penguins, wherever our penguin friend is, um, but in the northern hemisphere. Um, as soon as the daylight gets a little longer, they start molting um, and they go from 
from this um, to this. And pretty quickly, I saw my first one looking like this the other day. Why did they, they turn? It's for this. <laughs> anyway, and all the warblers that we love coming on up here in May, late May, um, right now are molting. Um, Caribbean, Central America. I used to live in Georgia. Mid-April was kind of the peak then. Um, so they're getting ready now. Um, and now we'll switch. <laughs> we're going to do mammals. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so snowshoe hair, we're talking about molting, molting with birds. Molting with animals, of course. Um, snowshoe hair is white in the wintertime. Great camouflage. Brown in the summertime. Um, let's see. Uh, this is a little youngster. Oh. It's a little wet and breezy in here. Um, I, I took this picture on June 4th, and it was on its own. This is on the Huber Trail on Vinyl Haven, and it hopped over, and it totally hunkered under that rock, like super instant. This is snowshoe hair in a nutshell. You can't see me. <laughs> the, even if they're bright white in the winter time and there's no snow around, they will just sit there like, you can't see me. Or after they molt and turn brown, if all of a sudden we get a snow in May or April, you can't see me, even though they stand out. I can see this guy. Um, but um, anyway, it's three to four weeks after they're born that they're weaned. But what's interesting is they're born precocial and independent, so alert and they can hop around. And after giving birth, the mother actually leaves her young scattered away from any nest. Not that this one was freshly born, but probably not too long ago. It still is, needs its um, mother. So maybe, let's say, two weeks, um, but even if it's three or four weeks, May 4th would be um, when it was born, so early May. And they have 34 to 40 day gestation period, so that's March 20th to April 1st. They would be mating. And what to look for in uh, snowshoe hair. I didn't know this before yesterday. Well, there's a lot of sniffing that goes on, but both hairs, the male and the female. So you might want to set up your trail cameras if you know where there's snowshoe hairs. They'll jump over each other. And while in midair, they urinate on the one below. And sometimes one will jump and the other one will run underneath it and get irritated on. Anyway, there you go. Um, and actually, as soon as the young are born, the female goes into estrus, goes into heat, and she can have up to four litters in a year. Um, so being on the bottom of the food chain pays off, I guess. Another molter, uh, somebody requested somewhere, ermine, ermine, um, and that is a weasel, mustelid family, my personal fa favorite family of uh, mammals. Wintertime, white with the black tip on the tail. It's kind of hard to see. April. Um, brown on the back, white on the belly. Um, an interesting thing. Um, oh, where are we here? Um, anyway, on Vinyl Haven, there were no ermine when I lived out there. There were mink and otters. Those were the two weasels, and they were very easy to tell apart. Otters are a lot bigger. Um, but then last March, I found a trail um, in the in the wintertime to track um, a smaller um, weasel mine and actually got one on my trail cameras and then in june a friend of mine sent me these pictures in her chicken coop and this is a baby a little kit and um anyway uh well <laughs> there weren't chickens in there to begin with and this guy was kind of um confused anyway um it was just interesting because they could uh Anyway, they have delayed implantation. And that's what I want. I wanted to tell you my delayed implantation poem. Um, it's only frustration for fans of gestation until the implantation occurs. Thank you. Um, what we mean by that is they will mate, um, make, uh, all, the, all the weasels mate, the egg gets fertilized, but it doesn't attach. And it stays floating. Bears do it too. Um, these guys will have it. It's their... Uh, eight months of delayed implantation so in theory that weasel that i saw with the, nobody knows how it got out there could have come out and been pregnant um and then after it finally attaches um it's 25 to 27 days and then three to four months um gestation period or um, no three to four months before they um they're independent this one was independent um which would put it about this time that these um uh 
ermine should be mating. Um, and once again, with the weasels, they mate, or no, they give birth, and about eight to 10 days later, they go into estrus where they are receptive to a male um, and they breed. Some of them, it's only a few days. This is that little baby, I know, little kid. And I just got a report from somebody way on the other side of the island who said um, that they saw a little white mink. It's, yeah, it's a weasel. Um, but speaking of mink, there's lots of mink on Vinyl Haven. And um, this is my favorite um, estrus story. I know we all have our own favorites. Um, winter of 2015 was one of those winters. It was crazy. There was snow. We didn't see the yard until May. I don't think there was any snow in January, February, March, and April. Tons and tons of snow. Lanes Island on Vinyl Haven. I was snowshoeing almost above the... the uh, um, the shrubs and stuff, and um, following a mink trail. I've been following them out there for years. We used to live on Lanes Island, and um, sure enough, I followed this trail. And you can see, this is a pretty good jump, pretty good bound. Um, during this jump, and I was following this mink around, all of a sudden, bloosh, bloosh, lots of blood. Using blood as a sign, um, as, a, the, you know, as a communication, um, this is estrus. And this female was in heat. And well, what's the date on this one? Oh, it was the 16th. So I guess um, Saturday will be the anniversary of this. Um, and I'd never seen it like this before. But then I realized that, that 2006, um, we'd already known where the where the mink, where I was out there all the time. We, I worked at Tanglewood every now and then, right? Like I barely had a job. So I was out there a lot tracking. We knew where the mink were going. And then one day we went out there in March and there were mink tracks everywhere. You could see where they rolled. You could see little blood spots. That is when they're in estrus and only for a short period of time. Anyway, that's mink. Um, and, uh, oh wait, they, they, have, they have a short delayed implant. For some reason, mink have a short delayed implantation, only 12 to 43 days. The whole reason for delayed implantation, I should mention this, is to assure that your um, offspring will be born at the right time. And also that as a parent or mother, she has enough resources to actually have them develop because they do you know, breed right after. This is a fisher, I got a call, this is actually, this Fisher, this was March 14th, 2022. This is my two year anniversary of taking this picture. Um, my neighbor called and said, hey, there's a Fisher in a tree. You wanna come see it? I went over, took the picture and that's when they said, oh yeah, there was another one that went running off and our dog treed this one. I was like, no way. Why would there be two Fishers together? Fishers don't get along. I backtracked it. There wasn't much snow, but there was snow like icy patches in the woods. And you saw where they kind of shuffled together and little drops of blood. They were there to mate. Of course, um, um, my friend, I ran into the guy who called me again a week later. And he said, yeah, it happened four times. We kept on sh scaring the fisher up the tree. And I was like, hey, why would you let your dog do that? But it was his yard. It was the dog's yard. This had never happened before. So this was, this was something. And why would a fisher stay right there and take that every day, four or five days in a row? Um, and the deal, I looked around and I found this opening, um, which highly, I mean, this was the tree that I took the picture of was right over here. Um, this was very close and actually right over a woods road. Um, lots of, you know, activity right there. And then lots of scat around the base. Um, this is the natal den. Once again, they give birth about 10 days later, they're ready to mate. So this was the 14th. We're looking at a March 4th possible um, birth. They give birth in the natal den, then they mate, and then they actually move the babies to a different uh, maternal den where they'll raise them until they get weaned, and then they move them to another one. This is um, a cavity, and I'll tell you, Aspen, awesome for fishers. These great, where old branches have um, uh, decomposed, fantastic cavities. Um, this one, I tracked her to this one a couple times. She didn't, I mean, they don't really, they're not really connected with uh, particular dens, unless they're giving birth or have given birth. This was in my neighborhood. This was in my yard, um, a couple hundred feet behind my house. And then I noticed, so I put a camera up there and I noticed that she was spending a lot of time. Oh, I wish we could see this. Oh, this is a video. Can't see it. Anyway, um, on May 31st, she drags the youngsters down. She has three kits. And they climb back up. Maybe at the end we can try and do it outside of the Zoom thing. Um, 
but th this is also a video, unfortunately. Um, this is three days later. So at the first night, she was dragging him to the bottom um, and they were climbing up because they didn't want to be out. This night, she's stuffing him back in the cavity. That's that cavity that I took a picture of. And they don't want anything to do with the cavity anymore. They're trying to get out of there. Um, ah, it's too bad. Oh, there it goes. I fixed it. It's for you, Mom. But how cool is that? Like, that's a lot. That's a lot. Let's try that again. Um, the female's going to be about three feet long total. Tail about two uh, a foot. Um, male's going to be about four feet long. Um, so here, let's see if we can do that again. Oh, no. What did I do? No, no. Okay, anyway, we got to see it once. That was pretty cool. Um, so I got days of this, and then five. You know, actually, this is on the fourth or on the third of June. I think it was the fifth that you, we saw them march out, and they left because I'm gonna guess they've been up there for um, how long? They've been up there since um, late March. Um, so they've been up there for two and a half months or something like that. And it must have been pretty gross. This I wanted to point out. This is a still shot from one of the videos I took. And this is a man, because fishers are awesome. Fishers run up and down trees. They can chase squirrels. And part they have these awesome claws. I mean, watching this female try to pull these babies. They're like, oh, I don't want to go anywhere. Um, but if you're running, can you just imagine running down a tree full speed with your claw? I mean, how do you not like run into the ground? They can rotate their hind feet about 180 feet. Feet, uh, degrees and somehow with the claws going the wrong way they still can go top speed running around a tree it's just crazy um anyway this is a squirrel that once they stopped nursing she would bring up food we saw i saw a picture of a you know bringing up um a green snake one day this is a squirrel i bet it got pretty nasty in that um in that den so then they moved on and that was a pretty awesome uh um year for me that was cool anyway it's gonna sound like a broken record um this actually this talk originally we toyed with the name mustelids on mid coast march and mid coast maine in march it was going to do just about estrus so you should be very thankful that that got shot down um anyway uh well, these are two uh, that i saw in um this is a clark island in one of the quarries anyway so um this is actually uh the What's this, 2000? This is the six year anniversary of me taking this picture. And this was one of these days. So, March is the time for mustelids. And for fishers, I should say this again fishers are hard to see. They're out, they're not, they're right over there. You don't see them. Now is the time where you're, you're more likely to see them because pheromones, mating, things take over. Anyway, this is one of those days. It snowed the night before, but it snowed until like eight in the morning. So, whatever tracks were laid kind of got covered. I went down to the marsh, the marsh behind my house, and you can see that there was a slush layer um, on the water, but you can also see where that line is in the water. And I saw that and I was like, huh, if I was an otter swimming through, if an otter was swimming through this, it would probably leave that line. I was like, oh, look, it came right over to here. You could see it was disturbed, but then got covered. And this is about a six by three area. And I went over to it and I was like, oh, look, it's a little orange. So then I put my fingers through it and I was like, whoa, it's red and it was red all over. That's my snow, snowshoe print. Um, this was um, otter estrus. This is estrus cake. Estrus, ice, estrus, ice, estrus. That's the um, recipe. Um, and that's my son Leaf hanging out by the estrus. <laughs> so um, what that means, um, they, get, they give birth and then 10 days later, they go into estrus. First off, we found out that the otter that we've been calling Larry was actually a female. Yeah. Um, because she was um, ready to mate, but also, oh, maybe this next video where oh, I hope so. Um, sorry, but you learn where these um females are, and there's one actually out on Clark Island that I've been keeping tab. I'm not keeping tabs. I have a trail camera. Trail cameras are awesome. Motion sensor, trigger. You don't have to be there. You're there for seconds at a time to set it up. And let's see if this one works. How did that other one work? Nope, nope. Yeah, I don't think the other one was on because we clicked on it. Oh. 
well, maybe at the end we'll show that this is, so two summers ago, a female raised four young, same female last year it raised four. This year, or 20, 2023, it was three. And it was interesting picking up on a personality that was going on. There's a, one of them that was very anxious and a little scared of stuff, <laughs> of getting in water. Anyway, anyway, let's move on. Oh, I should say otters. Oh, I'll say this. Here's some stats. Nine to 10 months um, of delayed implantation, 35 days of gestation. Um, uh, and they're in the uh, dens for 10 to 12 weeks. So, you know, June is when you might start seeing some of the baby um, otters. Anyway, probably the animal that I, this winter I've connected with more than any other has been the red fox. And it's been great. This is one. This I took this through my window, um, which I was pretty psyched on. Here it is, pouncing midair. Here it is, last winter, carrying a bull out of my yard. They can take as many as they want. Um, anyway, what are the red fox up to right now? They're giving birth. How do we know? Because of the crazy tracking in January. Oh. Hold on, I have a haiku here. I didn't write it. Well, I had it. It was here. Oh, there it is. Oh my gosh. This is behind the scenes magic. Sorry about that. Anyway, um, the reason that we knew that there was a lot of mating going on, a lot of stuff going on, was in January. It was crazy. I've never seen anything like this. Um, the, the, tra the trails all around. Um, if you read about when they're in estrus, and which is January, uh, December, and in, into February, um, lots of urine. They say, and if you've ever smelled red fox urine, it's very, very strong skunky smell. Very, very strong. And this was like there was urine here. Walk another fifty feet, there was urine, 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 urine. And um, um, some of it was red, which to me um, <laughs> means maybe a kidney issue. But apparently, the males. Um, we'll have red pee at this time. Track these two to this spot where you can still see some urine, but then there's all this blood right here in the middle. And that is estrus. Female red fox go into estrus for six days only. Um, and so this is where they were mating. Um, and everywhere we went in January, we could smell it. And this is Kristen Lindquist, who's a friend of mine who writes haikus, wrote this for me because <laughs> she went out on a walk with me and she some, once you get the smell, once you know what the smell is like, you smell it like from far. And she wrote, mapping, the white spruce forest, stink of fox piss. Anyway, <laughs> there you go. So that's what's going on with these guys. Coyotes, um, similar uh, to red fox, January through March breeding. Gestation is about two months. Um, so um, March to May, they could give birth. Um, this is one in my backyard as well. And then this is it jumping. And this is it pooping on my compost pile. <laughs> Action photo. We don't want the video of that. Um, this is a bobcat. I did not take this here. I took this in, I used to live in California and the bobcats everywhere. Um, very easy to see. Um, mating, they're just wrapped up their mating and they should be giving um, birth in about 60 days. So um, April into May. Um, once again, you know what you know? I don't see bobcat stuff that often where I live. Um, so short on that. Oh yeah, they're very common. Um, well, I don't know about Belfast at all. I'd say they're even if not. I mean, this has been a big year for me for red fox. Most years, it's coyotes and otters and fishers that I see. I think you know populations kind of come and go. Like the fisher bred in my neighborhood now, it moved on to wherever. Um, but there's a lot of coyotes. And they're big too, because they came through Canada and they either interbred with wolves or domestic dogs. They're quite big compared to the ones out West. Anyway, raccoons, quick raccoon story. Um, I took, uh, we're putting a trail in um, on Vinyl Haven and there was this hollowed out log that was about yo tall right next to it. And we we're gonna move it back. And I said, I'm gonna take a look inside of it. This is May 4th. And I took a look inside and I was like, whoa, we can't cut this down. There's an ear. <laughs> Um, right there. And we moved back. And of course, the raccoon ran away. So of course, we went in and took a picture. And this is May 4th. Um, those are three raccoon babies. And it says that they have three to five at birth. They're slightly furred. At two weeks, the masks are starting to show. I don't know if that's just their eyes or the mask. So I'm going to say two weeks or less, three to four weeks, their eyes are open. 
Um, anyway, gestation period is 30 or 63 days. And so we're looking, you know, if it's a couple weeks, April 20th might be the birth, which would mean February 17th mating. So right now there's pregnant raccoons walking around the neighborhood. So treat them nice. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. We saved the tree. Well, save the dead tree. Um, shrews. <laughs> if you're not familiar with shrews, you really should get familiar with shrews. They're totally cool. This is on Calderwood Island off of North Haven last June. Yeah, June 7th. These, they have very short lifespans, some species 18 months, some just a couple years, and they're ready to, they're January through into the fall, gestation is three weeks, days after giving birth, they can make two to three uh, litters in a year. These two, um, they had a third, had just been weaned, and they were on the beach, and they let me, I was taking a picture like this, and they were, they were fun, and then they were rolling around and stepping on each other. Um, beavers right now, um, they're active all year eating, um, bar, uh, eating bark in, in the wintertime and more leaves coming up in the summer, do the big splash. Um, th right now is the time for mating where a male will swim alongside a female in the water. I've never seen it, but apparently it's in the water, um, gestation hundred to 110 days. And that puts us into July. Like I said, they're active all winter. That's snow. <laughs> the beaver went up there to to fix it um, in the wintertime. Of course, they can be on the sides of ice. You don't get to see their tracks too often, even though they are out just because um, it's kind of thin ice. Porcupines year round mating in the fall. That's why you see a lot of roadkill in September. Um, it's the male, young males wandering around trying to find females. Um, pregnant for 205 to 215 days, seven months. That puts late March, early April for births. One single porky pet, they call it, with soft quills, just one. I think one's enough, man, with all that quills action. Um, of course, muskrats, um, also year-round activity, but mating is kicking in right now. Female goes into estrus. Um, this is Leaf pointing out a muskrat den. This is a couple of years ago. It's a little different now. And of course, deer are in the middle of their 200-day gestation period. Um, so May and June, there'll be a birth. Um, this is the... the, the that's kind of the, the, the show. This is some advice. If you do get into nature observation, know your tools. This is a trail camera. Um, that was, this is an otter latrine. You can see all the scat and all the tearing up, but you put up a camera. Sometimes you come to it and it's like a thousand pictures. And you're like, this is awesome. And like 900 of them are deer. Like <laughs> what's going on? Practice with your cameras. I used to take leaf. We used to set it up and like walk by um, because it's a great tool practice with your field guides, binoculars, um, your little cameras um, are great. Uh, I also tell everybody tell, to, to stretch, <laughs> stretch now. And if you do get into nature observation, you have to share. Um, you have to let other folks know. Um, these kids had helped out with uh, winter moth uh, censusing that ended up getting the parasitic flies to be brought out to vinyl, which was a huge thing. So they were rewarded um, we took them to see that first owl nest and there's Leaf and Zoe trying to cover their eyes. And then the last thing, I know this has nothing to do with the talk at all, um, but I'm going to dive, uh, I'm supposed to, it's a plug. That's what it's called, plug. Um, I'm going to have a show, a photo show at the National Wildlife Refuge headquarters in Rockland. It's April and May. Um, so April 5th is the opening. Just a slight plug there. Anyway, that's the show. Thanks for coming. All right, and questions. Thank you. And I will repeat questions. 20 questions. Yes. Oh, well, then I'm not taking the question. <laughs> Well, that the the uh, the moose. I don't think they're sure where the moose did not survive the winter. Well, it filled up a lot of freezers. Let's just put it that way. But that was my first year out there. That was two thousand four, two thousand five. The coyote had. It was there was a coyote that showed up on vinyl. The question was, she'd been out to Vinyl Haven on a trip um, with that I was leading, and um, was the coyote still around? Um, 
Because it was believed that it probably swam. I mean, who knows how it got out there? Island hopping. Um, if it was Idaho, um, easy hop, skip, and a jump in the winter time from Stonington. Got out there early two thousands, maybe by the two thousand six, two thousand seven. From what I had heard on Idaho was that the deer population was decimated. I don't know. You hear that enough from people. There's so many coyotes out there. If the population, the food was dropping, and if you're a young coyote and the, all you know is the southern end of Idaho and you're getting the boot from your group, I don't know, there's the spinny things and the red flashing lights, maybe go over there. Um, so that is kind of like the most plausible way to got there naturally. Of course, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories about people bringing it out. Um, it served, it was out there. I'm going to give you a mic. All right. Brenda, ladies and gentlemen, Brenda. Fantastic. She's here all week. Um, anyway, um, you know, it's funny because folks didn't believe it at first. And then folks were like, oh, I heard that there's two. I'm like, I don't know how you heard that. And then when it showed up the second year, I actually got a picture on a trail camera that the next thing I heard was folks was that. Um, Talk right into it. Okay. Um, was that uh, they'd heard that it had left. And I don't know how you hear like the coyote waved or something as it's swimming away. I don't know how you hear it left. Like nobody saw it doing anything. Um, as far as I know, it was fine. A couple of summers ago, an interesting, a bear showed up. People got picture videos of it swimming across the thoroughfare. Um, it was tagged. It had come from the Stonington area. Um, but it was so funny because people like for the next two years were sending me these photos of like just trees that were, you know, knocked over. Like, do you think a bear did this? I'm like, no. I don't think a bear did that. I think the bear took off like, as quickly as it got there. But um, things do show up on Vinyl Haven. It's pretty interesting. You have to repeat the question. Have bears appeared on other islands? Not that I know of, but it's funny. Moving, I was in Alaska, Homer, Alaska, before coming to Vinyl Haven. And I worked on a boat that, for, well, kind of worked on a boat every now and then, counting harlequin ducks and purple sandpipers. And when we would go around Idaho and go around Marshall Island, the whole time I was looking for bears. Because in Alaska, all this habitat was prime. Would have been there would have been bears. Um, maybe there used to be bears and they got kind of pushed off or whatnot. I don't know about other islands with things showing up. I would imagine Islesboro quicker. I mean, it's pretty close, so probably things show up out there more likely. All right, cool. And you you came back even though after going on a walk with me. That's cool. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. I heard about that, and I mean, you could probably. So the the comment was, you live on Islesboro. You used to live on. Oh no, Frenchboro. Excuse me, Frenchboro. Um, and that. Um, well, somebody tried to bring a raccoon in. The and they, they go, well, no, I didn't hear that. But the moose that made it out there, when it left, it headed out to sea. It was heading out to Africa. Like that was the next destination. And actually, lobstermen corralled it and chased it back to um, Frenchboro. Not, I mean, I don't know. What's, you know, what the, what, what is like the number one predator of moose up in Alaska is orcas. Um, they can swim very well. Moose can swim very well. I mean, I think, I guess young moose, maybe bear or wolf, but um, adult moose. Um, anyway, um, the, the, the moose. Yeah. Oh, well, I, yeah. Oh, it, it, I've never heard that, but I, I'm possibly it all, it, it's not too far of a jump to think of them coming from stonington area why they would do that i don't know once again popular deer on the mainland I mean, people come out to vinyl even a deer hunt because there's so many deer um 
so there's a lot less deer on the mainland. Maybe they're running out of food and, and got pushed out. Could have been. Um, there's Matinicus Island. Um, somebody was mad, apparently, at the locals and brought raccoons out there. Now they have raccoons. Not a very good neighborly thing um, to do. Um, but it's a, it's impressive what shows up on these islands. There's Dammer Scove Island. Does anybody know where that is? It's off. It's near Booth Bay. Yeah, but it's like the last thing out there. It's got the old um coast guard not coast guard the saving station life saving station we were counting purple sandpipers and we spent the night in the cove there on the boat and we got onto the island the next day and there's no trees there at all it's all you know little shrubs and there were beaver in the one pond there and they'd done it out of alders they'd made like their um den and stuff i think that was the only year that they were out there but things get pushed out rivers uh, um, things get you know pushed off islands because population food issues so there's all kinds of stuff going between the islands which is pretty interesting so we have two questions from zoom well more than two but first repeat where your um photo exhibit's going to be oh. please that's the easy question the, that's the easy one. Oh, good it's going to be at the headquarters of the main coast islands national wildlife refuge which is in rockland um kind of by the y behind Walgreens, that area. Um, it's a headquarters. Uh, I don't know what the address is. Okay. But um, yeah, the National Wildlife. In the date. April 5th is the opening, but it'll be April into, well, end of May. Okay, thank you. Um, and someone had a question, do we ever see Martin in the Midcoast area? Well, that's an interesting thing because um, uh, Billy Helprin, I don't know if anybody would know Billy Helprin, he's a naturalist guy out on MDI. He saw Martin's mating. And he would know what he's talking about. Supposedly, there's more and more Martins in Maine. I only know the peninsula. I mean, probably around here. I mean, you're connected to a lot bigger, vast wilderness that it could come from or, or woods areas. Um, I haven't seen them down in St. George. Um, okay, another question from Zoom. Um, this person asked that they have five to six inch holes and burrows in a covered compost pile. Would that be a rat, a mole, or other? I'm going to guess rat. Okay. That's all from Zoom. All right. Yeah. Do mink or fishers eat green crabs? Uh, not that I've seen. Um, mink definitely will take crabs, but I feel like it's the bigger, um, native ones. Um, fishers don't go fisher. It, it's fisher is such a funny name. It's the Dutch fizz, which or something like that. Um, fisher cats, sometimes people call them. They don't go in the water. They don't eat fish and they aren't cats. Like the only <laughs> thing that's correct in that name is the er, you know, part of it. That's it. Um, green crabs. What I've seen eat green crabs, eiders. I've seen eat a lot of green crabs raccoons it is fun to watch raccoons go through the seaweed and they're picking out these green crabs i mean clearly they're not eating enough um to make a difference things are eating them i mean the eider population i mean has dropped considerably since blue mussels aren't as prevalent it was nice that was actually in seal bay on vinyl haven to see some eiders eating some green crabs it would be great if they did that more but yes penguin friend How many different mammals are in Maine? Wow. Um, more than 10. Um, well, you know, you got the bats. I I would, I don't know um, numbers offhand, but when you think of it, there's two foxes. There's the silver or gray fox and red fox. Moose, white-tailed deer. Let's go with raccoon, skunk. Um I said raccoons. <laughs> we can't say the raccoons. All the, I mean, there's got to be, and that's just like the one, like the terrestrial ones, bats. I mean, this I took in Maine waters. This is a white-sided dolphin. Um, I just love that reflect. Anyway, um, you know, if you start incorporating like whales, humpback whales, fin whales, minke whales, harbor porpoise, harbor seals, gray seals, harp seal, there's a lot. 
lynx, bobcat. Some people say mountain lion. Um, Laura Sebastianelli says man. wolves. Okay, yeah, wolves. Coyotes, we didn't say that yet. Fox, red fox, porcupine. Oh, that's right. The, that's where I was trying to go. Rodents, porcupine, beaver. Most right, snowshoe hare. Lots. That's a tough question. That's a tough question. A lot. A lot. That'll be the answer. Anyway, another one. Are there mountain lions in Maine? I've never seen one. I've never seen tracks. There's no reason why there couldn't be. Um, there was supposedly a tanglewood. There was some scat. This was a legend. There's so many legends out there that you hear about. Scat that was sent in somewhere that they can do DNA testing and it came back mountain lion. I'll just say this. There was that mountain lion that got hit and killed in Connecticut not 10 years ago or so, maybe even a little longer, that had they tracked, they DNA tested it, and it had come from, what, Montana? It, made, it had been spotted once in Ohio. That was the only time it made it all the way to Connecticut and got hit on the Merritt Parkway or whatever. And um, I don't know why it's a type of road, but um, so they're, they're, those are totally stealth. I mean, I've seen them in California and it's this flash and they could be around. I mean, I haven't, if they're around in any number, well, they're not around in any numbers, but them passing through certainly could happen, I would think. And there's a lot of Maine that nobody goes to as well, or so it feels. That's what I was told why, why there's Sasquatch here. <laughs> but there's the Sasquatch side. And I said, you never see their tracks that nobody ever goes out there. <laughs> yes. It's um, there is an there's two species of cottontails. There's the eastern cottontail, which oh, okay oh, what's happened with the cottontail pop? I told you you could say that. Um, what happened? What's happened with the cottontail population? The you know bunnies with the white. Um, there's eastern cottontail, which is not having any issues. Maybe in Maine it's dropping a little bit, but as far as the overall population, they're the ones you see all over New England. New England cottontail has very specific habits. I mean, my friend, um, <laughs> Big Al Jones, just did a study on him for college, and he never saw him. Like, he never saw him. He saw they, they, what they would, they would find their droppings and send them in and get them tested. Um, their numbers have dropped. I think it's more of habitat loss. They, like, really shrub, like, really, like, dense, thicket kind of stuff. That's why you never see them. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I've been keeping up on that. But I mean, I've been hearing that for years. Well, probably you never saw New England cottontails, but probably, and I'll say it on Vinyl Haven, there's tons of snowshoe hair. And they're all, and that's how I found those two nests. I'm going to say it. There was a small pile of snowshoe hair bone legs underneath them. Um, that's what they eat. Here on the mainland, I hardly see snowshoe hair sign. And that there's, way more predators, There's so many predators. Um, they, I still see the sign and actually well, Aldermere Farm or Erickson Field on 90 is a good place um, where I've see, seen them. In, um, so they're still around, but there's just so many predators. I'm gonna imagine if you saw less and less, might be habitat loss, but rabbits do pretty well. You know, They don't really mind it as much, um, but all the predators is what I toss it up to. All right. Yes. You didn't talk about woodchucks, did you? No, or geese. Or geese. <laughs> woodchucks. Our favorite garden visitor. I, well, one, this is another one of those, you know, which, you know, I don't even have a picture of a woodchuck. I'd never see them. I, I, no, I didn't say I've never seen them. I say I never see them. Hardly ever see them is what I should say. Well, you should do the woodchuck program. <laughs> all right any other all right if you have any more you can come on up in person thanks for joining Wanna... okay. oh can we try the videos oh yeah maybe they're not going to work we don't have quick time on the computer oh, okay. it's, it's on the Zoom. i don't think so but
You can try. I can try and I can fail. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's like the New Jersey mantra. Loading. Quick time not available. Yeah. You're so tech. Anyway, oh, here I can plug it. Um, I'm on Instagram, Bald Fulmar. This video is on um, my reels, if you want to spend time looking through my reels. <laughs> anyway. All right. all right. Thank you so much, Kirk, for being with us tonight. And thank you all for coming out and joining us.